Good morning. Well, that was loud. It's a little chilly, but it's nice. Well, it's better than snow, isn't it? Um, I'd like to remind everybody, uh, if you'd sign your uh, little black books and sit them down, if it's your first time, make sure that you uh, sign that. Good morning. And... Uh, if you would like to talk to anybody after church or during church, Mark or one of the deacons, anybody would uh, be happy to do that. Um, got some announcements, several of them. The uh, World Mission offering is being collected this month and the information uh, is in the, uh, your bulletin. And if you'd like to donate to that, we have a goal of $1,000 and right now we're at 619 also, if you would like to make a monetary donation to the relief efforts in North Carolina or Tennessee, you may uh, do so through the One Great Hour of Sharing. If you're writing a check, uh, just put the OGHS in the memo line. And please, uh, you know, if you put it in an envelope or a note with it to make sure that we get it to the right place. If you do both those things, it would help. Um, the thank you from uh, Mark and Kim for the Pastor Appreciation Month, and uh, they uh, feel blessed. They say that they call um, First Baptist Church home, and I think we feel really blessed too. And we're really glad that you chose here to be your church, and, and we appreciate everything that you do. Also, I got another thank you. Uh, from Doris. To my church family, I want to say a very special thank you for the privilege of getting uh, to go to the convention this year. It was an awesome time giving praise and worship to uh, our Savior, and I love all of you. Thank you, Doris. Also, uh, they need volunteers for the American Red Cross. The blood drive will be uh, Monday, November 25th at the EMS building from 1 to 5, and there's a sign-up sheet in the educational wing. Uh, and on Friday, November 29th, during the Miracle on Main Street, there will be hot dogs, cookies, hot chocolate given out at the Carson Center. If you would like to uh, donate uh, some baked goods, they need those wrapped in packages, packaged, and any candy donations can be dropped off to the church office. In our schedule, um, of course, FBC Kids this evening. And on uh, Tuesday the 29th at 5, we'll have uh, the youth. And also the fabric on canvas is that evening from 6 to 8. And the sign-up sheet's in the hall. I think the max on that's 15. And I assume that it's not full since we're still announcing that. Um, Wednesday the 30th, there will be no choir but Bible study will be at uh, 7 p.m. and on Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Bible study. Saturday, uh, November 2nd, will be the pr men's prayer uh, breakfast. And right now it's at Watersmith State Park, but that could change. Uh, Mark will get that out to everybody if it does change and be here at the church by 7 to uh, travel there. Uh, and that, again, is next Saturday the 2nd. And on Sunday the 3rd, remember Daylight Savings Time ends, and we'll have a uh, breakfast that morning. So um, just to remind everybody. And also on Monday the 4th, instead of Tuesday, our boards and committees will meet on that day because of Election Day. So it'll be a day early, so try to mark your calendars for that. And right now we have a mission moment. For those who had parents, every year I waited and not having them visit me, so I always asked myself if I wasn't good enough for my parents, would I ever be good enough for anyone else? So that day when we were told that there were going to be people coming to our homes to bring us gifts, and they kept repeating the phrase, Jesus loves you, uh, I started to walk away when a man motions me back and 
um, he's, he tells me, where are you going? You don't have a shoebox yet. And I quickly reply, but I don't have any parents. And um, that's when he looked directly into my eyes and with a smile on his face, he just hands me the shoebox and he tells me, Jesus loves me. As I received that, I kept looking at it and I started to walk away. And I looked back to see if the man was going to come back and take the shoebox back, but he didn't. And he knew what I was thinking, so he just smiled and waited for everybody to have a moment to open the shoebox. That day was just full of joy. So my wow item was a, a soccer ball, and I couldn't believe it, that it was mine, um, that I just remember opening it and receiving that soccer ball. And I just remember just playing in the orphanage. We had a big field to play on, and I just remember running with the soccer ball all, all over the orphanage. So it was that moment when I realized that I was loved and I was seen. With my shoebox, I also received the greatest gift booklet. And I, that's when my prayer journey began, and I started to pray for a family. When I was 10 years old, I was called into the office of the orphanage and I was told that there was going to be a family in the United States who wanted to adopt me. And I was introduced to my adopted family and I just remember running to them and calling them familia. Now I live my life saying yes to the Lord because I have no reason to say no. He did not just give me a family, but he gave me a new life. Good morning. Shoe boxes. There's lots of empty ones. It's in the orphanage. I was not allowed to play soccer simply because I was a girl. Uh, uh, that's okay. It's okay. Uh, anyway, the, the shoe box gift. Some people, you know, look at these videos and they say, "Well, you know, these kids have some stuff." Well, yeah, they do. But it's more than just the gifts inside. It's the message, and the message is, some of them never have never heard, Jesus saves, and God is with you. And so these boxes, even if they've been to a church, it's an affirmation that there is more than just what they have in front of them. Um, I talked to a lady, I believe she was from Ukraine, and she said, you know, we could tell Americans anytime they came because they smile too much. Now, that sounds pretty odd, but there was nothing but darkness and dismal life where she was from. And so to smile, we kind of look at it like it's natural, but it was abnormal to her because they don't smile. They don't feel joy. And so getting your box is full of joy. Now, with the box, don't forget to pick up a, a pamphlet because on the back is where your labels are. Okay, and also there's an envelope if you want to make your donation straight to Samaritan's Purse. Now, I'm going to tell you, they suggest highly that you go online and do it online because then you can follow your box. And all you have to do is, same thing, go to Samaritan's Purse, I think it's .org, and find Operation Christmas Child, go down through there and you can register your box and they will send you an email later on to tell you where your box has gone. Now it won't specifically tell you exactly where but it'll give you a range of places that boxes were shipped. He mentioned a soccer ball and I know we've talked about this numerous times. A soccer ball is something that's almost impossible to get into a box until you deflate it. Now I'm going to tell you something that you can cheat with. If you go to Amazon, you can buy deflated soccer balls. <laughs> so that's what I do. Don't forget, they need a pump. And probably the most important piece, which you need to tape to something, is the needle. Make sure that you have that in there. Also, speaking of shopping, when you go to Amazon and put in... Um, Operation Christmas Child, it will come up with all kinds of things that you can buy for shoe boxes. So please pack a box. It makes a difference. Let a child smile. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, let's have our time of greeting.
trying to tell people. We were just, we were just hanging out, and then everybody came in the spirit. Yeah. Thomas Hines. That's what I'm going to say. Thank you. Thomas Hines. That's it. Okay, we'll have our praise course uh, in the blue book, number 227. Don't forget, we have a long list of prayer requests on, on our bulletin that's there every week. And also, I'm sure there's a lot of unspoken prayer requests that we need to remember. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. And we just pray for the names that we've lifted up here this morning, that you would heal, comfort, whatever, whatever they need. We just pray that it will happen. And we pray for everyone on this list, dear Lord, that whatever they would need, if it would be healing or comfort or their family needs help, whatever, whatever it may be, dear Lord, we just pray that those, that uh, these things would be answered and that we would do our part in prayer and, and assistance. In Jesus' name we pray. Join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll have a children's chat. to make to you all this morning. Did you ever forget something? Or not check a schedule or something? Well, that happened to me this morning. I got to church, and I was greeting people, and all at once this one lady said, Evelyn, you have children's chats today. And I went, oh, no, I forgot. But I'll tell you what, I have this book that I've been wanting to read to you all. So I rushed home to get it. I don't live too far away, praise the Lord. So anyway, the thing was, I lost my parking spot. <laughs> but anyway, we're here. So have you all ever heard about the rainbow fish? No. No, you have? You haven't? Anyway, this is really my favorite, favorite book. You know the rainbow fish? Can we read it again? Okay, I'm going to read the rainbow fish to you because I really think it's a wonderful lesson and I like this. This is one that I'd always thought I would read to you guys sometime. So, we're going to talk about the rainbow fish. A long way out in the sea, there lived a fish. No, not an ordinary fish, but the most beautiful fish in the whole ocean. His scales were the shade of blue and green and purple with sparkling silver uh, sh scales. See the b rainbow fish? Yeah. See how it shines? Yes. So you know what's going to happen to his scales? 
We'll find out. Okay, the other fish were so jealous, and they would say, come, you know, uh, rainbow fish, come and play with us. But the rainbow fish wouldn't do it because he was afraid that his scales would fall off, and he liked for them to just shimmer. So as we read this, think about how you treat others, okay? All right. One day, a little blue fish came by and he said, Rainbow fish, wait for me. Please give me one of your scales. They are so wonderful, and you have so many. You think you'll give him one? No. I don't know. Let's see. You want me to give you one of my spatial scales? Why do you think, who do you think you are? Get away from me. Isn't he being nasty, isn't he? So the little blue fish swam away, and he was so upset. So he turned, to, uh, but he just swam away. What? Uh, so there he was, and his shimmering scales that no, you know, he liked him, but no one else uh, thought that he was a good fish because he was very lonely because he was so mean. And so one day he poured out his troubles to starfish, and he said, I am so beautiful. Why doesn't anyone like me? Why do you think he don't, they don't like him? Because he's mean. That's right. The rainbow fish found a cave. It was very dark inside, and he couldn't see anything. Then suddenly two eyes caught him in the glare, and it was an octopus. See the octopus, you know, with all those arms? Uh, we'll see what the octopus... Twelve. How many has? Twelve, yes, that's right. And the octopus said, I've been waiting for you. And he said, um, you will no longer be the most beautiful fish in the world, see, but you will have to, dis but you must discover how to be happy. So he told him, you know, he should start being nice to these people. And the rainbow fish said, I can't. I, I can't give away my scales, my beautiful shining scales. How could ever, how, ever be happy without them? You think he could be happy without his scales, without being all shiny? He doesn't think so. Suddenly he felt a touch of a fin, and it was that little blue fish was back. And Rainbow Fish said, please don't be angry. I just want one of your scales. And Rainbow Fish said, only one? Well, maybe I won't miss just one. See little blue fish? <coughs> little Rainbow Fish. Carefully, he pulled the smallest scale out, and he gave it to the little fish. Thank you, thank you so much, the little blue fish said. And uh, so then uh, the little blue fish swam back and forth with his new scale. See, he's got the little scale right there that he gave him. But rainbow fish still has a lot of scales, doesn't he? He was pretty selfish. But was he happy? Mm, yeah. No. After, he was going to be happy when the little blue fish uh, was swimming all around. And so um, Rainbow Fish told his uh, friends that uh, he had gotten this scale from the Rainbow Fish. So finally Rainbow Fish uh, ended up just giving all of his fish. He gave this one and that one, and they said, come, play with us. And he was happy as he splashed and swam off to join his friends. See all the rainbow fish? See the scales he gave his friend, gave the little fish? Yeah, it looks like he only has one left. And he only has one left. Thank you. So finally, rainbow fish had only one scale left and his most prized possession and had been given away. But he was very happy. So this tells us we need to be kind to one another. And if we have something we can share, we need to do that, don't we? Yes. So um, let's have a little prayer, okay? Our most holy and precious Heavenly Father, I thank you for each of these little ones. I pray, Father God, that you will just touch them with your spirit and just uh, fill them, Lord Jesus. Help them to be generous with what they have. Help us all, Father God, to be kinder to one another and be like uh, the, uh, not to be like the rainbow fish that tried to be so selfish, but ended up being happy. So, Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Whoever praise him now, number 19. Praise him, praise him. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we take this offering that we keep you in the forefront of our lives and we pray that we would do the right thing with with the money that we give, the money that you've given us, and we just thank you for all the blessings that we have and the blessings that you've given us and the blessings that you will give us, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let us bow for a word of prayer. Dear Father, we, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, of being in your house this morning on this beautiful, beautiful sunny Lord's Day. And Father, we just thank you for each one that's here, both in your, in your sanctuary, those who are watching by way of live stream. Father, we just pray your blessings upon each one and, and their families. Father, we pray for those who are absent from us, um, those who are traveling, those who are ill. Father, those who have been mentioned here this morning in need of prayer, those who are on our prayer list, and Father, those on our hearts and minds, we just lift them up to you, Lord, and just ask that you would, would be in each situation, Father, that you would provide the healing that is needed, Provide the, the peace and the comfort. Father, for those who have lost loved ones this week, we just pray a, a special touch on those families, that you would just uh, bring peace and comfort to them. And dear Father, we, we just thank you um, for your church. We, we thank you for this time together. We, uh, we thank you for the presence of your spirit with us this morning. And Father, I just pray that you would prepare our hearts and minds that we might be receptive to your word today. Father, be with each one that has a part in the service. And, and Father, we just pray for your continued guidance for the leadership of your church. Father, that we would uh, do and say the things that you would have us to do. That we would be the, the servant-minded heart the servant-minded church that you would have your church to be. Father, again, we just thank you for all of your blessings, all of your goodness to us. And, and Father, we just lift you up in praise this morning. Father, we just, uh, we just ask that all things accomplished this day, all praise and glory would be yours. And Father, again, we just uh, ask that you be with us, be with us in our Sunday school hour, Go with us as we leave this place today that we might be that light to the broken and lost world, that light that is so needed. And Father, all these things, I, I just pray in Jesus' holy name. going to be singing a very familiar one. So I would love for you all to, to help me and to sing out. Um, this song talks about God's amazing grace and how wonderful it is and that he is with us in all times, the good, the happy, the scary. And um, it's because of his grace um, that our chains have been lifted and are gone. And we are saved because of that grace and can go to heaven someday. Mercy reigns, unending love. 
Yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes. <laughs> yes. And you wouldn't even give me a sucker at Trunk Retreat last night. <laughs> we, uh, it's been a, a busy weekend for the youth. The, they had a lock-in Friday night, uh, they helped uh, give out candy last night at uh, Trunk Retreat, and uh, I know many of them, and I know their leaders and the volunteers and some of the parents are exhausted after the past couple of days, but uh, it was worth it. We had 24, I think, uh, kids, youth that were out for the lock-in, and that's just uh, remarkable. Um, we're blessed. We're blessed to have that many, and it wasn't wasn't easy for the for the leaders to to do that. But uh, it's a wonderful thing, and it's it's good that, to see you here today as well. Uh, a little different, but it's it's a good day, and it's good to to be here and be a part of this, uh, be a part of God's family. It's. Um, I noticed earlier as the sun was coming through there, it kind of blinds me. I can't, can't exactly see everyone's face, and, and uh, that may be good by the time I get through with this sermon. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, I, I, I want to again express uh, both Kim, Kim's and my appreciation for the love and, and kindness uh, that you've shown us, not only last Sunday, but, but every day. Um, Last week was Pastor Appreciation Sunday, and the meal last Sunday uh, was awesome. The the fellowship, the cards, uh, your gifts and and kind words. And and for those of you in the church who who don't know, as a church, you you gifted me a watch, a a very nice watch. And and you gifted Kim a, a very beautiful necklace as well. 
But this watch, um, and I appreciate this so much, and it was pointed out to me that I can set an alarm on here that will uh, let me know when my sermon time is up. Uh, I wasn't able to do that this morning, but uh, I will find uh, an eight or nine year old this week that can show me how to, to do that, and I'll have it done for next, next week. The... Uh, we do. We appreciate the church so much, and we're so blessed to, to be here and, and be a part of this um, with you all. The title of my sermon this morning is, You Can't Say That in Church. You can't say that in church. And our text today is, is Romans 13, uh, verses 1 and 2. And I'll go ahead and look at that quickly here. Romans 13, verses 1 and 2. And I'll be reading from, and I think this is behind me on the screen as well, from the New American Standard Bible. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Let's pray. Dear Father, we, we thank you for your word this morning. And Father, I just pray that uh, you would be with me as I, I bring the message. I just pray that you would give me the words to speak. And, and Father, that we would be receptive to your word. Father, that we might respond in a way that would be in accordance with your will. That we might, by our actions and our words, uh, just praise and exalt you and bring others uh, in a closer relationship to your son. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Also very dry today. In nine days, we're going to experience something that only happens every four years here in the United States. We're going to elect a new president. And, and I can't think of anything uh, that has created more anxiety, more, more fear and, and division in our country over the past 20 or, or 25 years than our presidential elections. Politicians and, and elections in general they don't usually bring to mind words like, like honesty and integrity, truthfulness and, and fairness. And, and the news outlets and, and social media contribute significantly to the, to the stress and, and the distress that each one of us feels during this election process. And listen, I know, I know what you're thinking. Preacher, last Sunday, we celebrated Pastor Appreciation Sunday. We had a nice big dinner in your honor. We gave you cards and gifts, and we told you how much we loved you, and, and we appreciated you. Are you sure this is something you want to talk about today? I mean, you realize how dangerous this is, don't you?
Yeah, I know. And, and no, this, this really isn't my choice of a message today. But I believe this is what God wants me to talk, talk to you about this morning because God and I have wrestled with this for the past week or more. So please just say a, a quick prayer for, for me. I mentioned the anxiety and the fear that, that surrounds many of us during this, during this time. And, and, and I have no intentions of adding to your stress this morning. I, I will not endorse any candidates today. I will not endorse any political parties during my time with you this morning. Don't take anything I say today as a, an endorsement of any kind. You can, you can rest easy this morning. Okay, you can breathe. I'm not Fox News and I'm not CNN and EM, MSNBC. This is just me. What I do hope to, to share with you this morning is, is general in nature. And it has a scriptural foundation. And it's meant, I believe, to accomplish two things. And the first is to identify how Christians, how we should approach the election. Maybe I should have had this message a few months ago. And also how we should approach those who are in authority over us. Whether it be at the, the national, the state, or, or the local level. And this includes how we should live, respecting the views and, and the positions of others, particularly, particularly our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, without sacrificing our own moral and, and, and ethical convictions. The second thing is how we can, how we can and, and also how we should live in peace. And I'm not talking about worldly peace, but I'm talking about a spiritual peace. Understanding God's sovereignty in all things and putting our faith and our trust in the promises of, of God for eternity. Now, throughout this, this past spring and summer, I've, I've talked often about discernment. And how critical that the proper discernment, how, it, how critical it is for us in our lives, how we live and, and how God intends for us to live. And, and I've talked about the need of both prayer and I've talked about the need of uh, spiritual, scriptural guidance in our lives. It's important for our, our discernment process. Both prayer and, and God's word, they're, they're essential for us as believers as we, as we discern decisions in our daily lives, including decisions that we ultimately make in the voting booth. The Bible is very clear on how believers should pray for their, for their country and their government leaders. Scripture emphasizes that we should pray. We with intercession in mind, with respect and, and a desire for peace and godly wisdom in our leadership. Let me share just a few of those passages with you. First from 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and for all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. And in these two verses, we, we find Paul instructing believers to, to pray for all people. But here he mentions a, a particular group, those who, who are in authority, those who are in leadership positions, and at that time, that would have included the kings, the emperors, the, the governors, and, and other rulers. But then Paul gives us the, the purpose for these prayers so that society may experience peace and order. We need to be praying for our leaders, 
Those in authority over us, we need to be praying in the same manner as Paul was, is saying here in these two verses. Not just the leaders and, and, and officials that we agree with politically, but all of them. That's what Christians are called to do. First and foremost, we should be praying for their salvation. Maybe that sounds a, a little weird to you. We should be praying for the salvation of our leaders. I hope that doesn't sound weird because we should be praying for the, the salvation of everyone. As followers of Christ, that should be at the forefront of our minds for everyone we meet. We should be praying for the salvation of our friends, our, our family members. We should be praying for the salvation of our neighbors and, and our enemies. And we should be praying for the salvation of those in, in authority over us. Even those who, who disagree with us politically, who, who disagree with us theologically. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says this about God. He who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And, and two verses later here... In chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. God desires that all be saved. The sacrifice that, that Christ made on the cross, his, his mercy and his grace are free and available to anyone who will just repent and follow him. Anyone and everyone who will just repent and follow him. We need to be praying for all people. But Paul says here in this verse, we need to be praying for our unsaved rulers, our unsaved leaders. Praying for our, our leaders, it allows us to live in godliness and, and dignity under the authority of, of what God has allowed. In our text that, that I read to you just a few moments ago from Romans 13, Paul states that government authorities are, are not only allowed, but are, they're ordained by God. And Paul explains that, that all government and authority come from God and that we as Christians should respect and, and obey governing authorities as part of our submission to God. Again, this tells us that the governing authorities are established by God. They are ordained by God. And by praying for our leaders, we acknowledge God's sovereignty over all earthly government, over all of our earthly leaders. And these leaders, now they may believe that the power and authority that they have, it, it comes from within them. They may believe it comes from within the system that they, that they operate in. But we know we know that all human power and authority comes from God. And just as it comes from God, it can be removed by God at any time. These verses, they also emphasize the importance of, of respecting and, and submitting to lawful authority. And this is a part of, of God's divine, divine order. Another passage addresses this point even further, and we find that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And these verses, they, they reflect the view that the governing authorities are intended to, to maintain order and justice, which are roles that are, that are necessary and purposeful for, for our society. And those verses, they read, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to the governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers 
and the praise of those who do right. But there are things that need to be considered. There have to be some limitations on this, right? We shouldn't just blindly, we shouldn't just blindly submit to a, an authority that, that contradicts God's commands. Scripture provides us both, both teaching and, and examples throughout the Bible that, that support the principle of obeying God over human authority. When there is a conflict between the two, God is always the side we need to be on. One of the, the most direct words of instruction can be found in, in Acts 5, verse 29. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The apostles were imprisoned for preaching and, and teaching about Jesus. But if you remember, the, the angel of the Lord came and, and set them free from jail and, and told them to go to the temple and to begin speaking again. So they went and they began teaching in Jesus' name, but they were arrested once again and, and they were brought before the council. And the high priest questioned them. He said, we gave you strict orders not to, not to continue teaching in his name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And that's, that's when the apostles, they, they responded with, we must obey God rather than men. The apostles were commanded by the Jewish authorities to, to stop teaching in Jesus' name. And they made it immediately clear that when human commands conflict with God's commands, God takes precedence. I'm sure you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel's three friends. Remember, they, they refused to bow down to the, the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had made and, and commanded that all would, would worship. If you didn't, you'd pay the price. And in Daniel 3, beginning with verse 15, the second part of that verse, it says, But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you set up. Again, when the commands of earthly leaders, when they conflict with God's instructions, God always takes precedence. We need to also pray for our leaders that God would guide their decisions and in turn their impact on our, our lives and our country. If you listen to the words of Proverbs 21.1, it says, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. And this proverb, it, it teaches that, that God is ultimately in control. He controls the hearts and, and the minds of the leaders. He, he directs their decisions. When we pray, when we pray for our government leaders, in essence, we're asking God to, to direct their hearts according to his will. We trust that, that God can influence them and, and guide them in, in ways that will fulfill his purpose. 
Psalm 2, verses 10 and 11, it encourages rulers and, and our government leaders to exercise proper discernment in their service to man and reverence in their service to God. Now, therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. It would be wise. It would be wise for us as believers to, to pray that our leaders would, would govern with wisdom, with a sincere fear of the Lord, and with humility. We also need to pray for our nation in general. In Jeremiah 29, 7, it says, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. Although this, this passage refers to Israel's exile, the principle of, of seeking and praying for the, for the well-being of a nation, a state, or even a city, it applies to us today. When we pray for the prosperity and peace and welfare of the, of the country where we live, it benefits everyone, not just us, but it benefits everyone living in its boundaries. What are some practical ways we can, we can pray for our country and our leaders? We can pray for wisdom and guidance for our president, for Congress. We can pray that they would make decisions that are just and righteous and, and aligned with God's will. We can pray for peace and stability in our nation, that our, our citizens would live in harmony and that justice and, and order would prevail. We can pray for the protection of our government leaders, asking God to, to keep them safe and to surround them with both wise and, and godly counselors. We can pray for the spiritual condition of our leaders. Our president, senators, our representatives, we can pray for them that they would come to know or, or grow in their knowledge of Christ and lead with humility and, and integrity. We can pray for our nation's welfare, asking God to, to bless our nation with prosperity and, and peace and, and the freedom to worship him. As followers of Christ, we're called to pray for our government leaders with a heart of intercession. We recognize that all authority comes from God. As we pray for, for wisdom and peace and, and godliness in our government leaders, we collectively contribute to the welfare of our nation and we, and we demonstrate our complete trust in, in God's sovereignty over both our leaders and our nation. Well, Pastor, that's, that's well and good once we have our, our leaders in place. But we have an election going on, and it's a mess. I don't know who to vote for. Or maybe you're thinking, well... I can do this prayer thing if my candidate gets elected. But if uh, you know who gets elected, mm, all bets are off. As a Christian man or woman, someone who sincerely wants to do the will of God, this election process, it, it can be tough. It is tough for a Christian uh, approaching the election of a new president or, or any government official. It should be guided by biblical principles. It should be guided by prayer and, and a commitment to 
aligning our actions with, with God's will. This process, it should always begin with prayer. Just like everything we do, it should always begin with prayer. And, and it needs to be filled with prayer throughout the process. It involves discernment, prayerful consideration, and, and a focus on godly values that, that should be reflected in our leaders. I'd like to look at a few of these, these key biblical principles that, that should guide us through this selection process. First, we, we need to pray for our own wisdom and discernment. Because we can't do this on our own. We need God's help. Christians are called to, to seek God's wisdom in, in all decisions, in, in, including elections. Various places in Scripture encourage believers to, to pray for guidance when, when making important decisions. In James 1, verse 5, it says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. All we have to do is ask. Proverbs 3, beginning with verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and, and he will make your path straight. Amen, sister. Christians should pray for wisdom and, and clarity in discerning which, which candidate aligns most closely with biblical values and the principles of truth and, and justice and righteousness. The second biblical principle that should guide us as, as Christians during the election is we need to evaluate the candidates based on godly values. And as Christians, we, we should evaluate candidates based on character, values, policy positions that, that ref reflect biblical teaching. And some of the attributes that, that we should consider are things like justice and, and righteousness. Our leaders should promote justice and, and defend the rights of the poor and the, and the vulnerable and the oppressed. If we look at the words of Proverbs 29, verse 2, it says, When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, people groan. And, and what this is basically saying is that when, when leadership is good, Society is happy, but when, when evil rules, society is miserable. Some other attributes we should look at in our leaders are integrity and honesty. I mean, integrity and truthfulness and, and fairness are, are key qualities of leadership. In Proverbs 16, 12, it says, It is an abomination for kings to commit wicked acts. For a throne is established on righteousness. We should also expect our leaders to have respect for life. A biblical view of life includes protecting the, the sanctity of life at, at all stages. From conception to, to natural death. Exodus 20 verse 13 you shall not murder. This is the sixth of the, of the Ten Commandments, which forbids us from taking the life of the innocent. And this commandment reflects God's commitment to justice, specifically protecting innocent life. Murder is, is understood here as the deliberate and, and, and wrongful taking of life without justification especially of someone who is defenseless and, and vulnerable. In Psalm 139, beginning with verse 13, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. 
I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I, I realize, as I'm, I'm sure you do, there, there's another sermon here, but that's not my intentions today, and I don't believe that's God's intentions today either. As again, again, as Christians, we, we must consider the values, the policies, and, and character of all the candidates. And then ask ourselves, which one? Which one best reflects the, the biblical principles of righteousness, of justice, and respect for life? Another biblical principle we must remember during the election is is one I mentioned earlier, we must recognize God's sovereignty over the elections. Scripture teaches us that, that God is sovereign over the rise and fall of leaders. And, and while we are called to be involved and, and make wise decisions, we, we must trust that God is in complete control of the outcome. Two verses I shared with you earlier from from Daniel and Romans, it is he who changes the times and the epics. He, he removes kings and establishes kings. And from Romans 13, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. We, we need to cast our vote responsibly and prayerfully but we must be willing we must be willing to accept the outcome right whatever that may be whoever that may be we must trust fully in God's ultimate plan we we must remember God's sovereignty that God is in control because we know, we, we have assurance from his word that, that he works through governments and leaders according to his divine will. Did you know that voting is a, a biblical principle? We are to vote with a, with a heart for justice and, and the common good. The Bible is clear that we are to promote justice, righteousness, and, and the common good. Christians are called to, to care for the marginalized, the poor, and the oppressed. In Micah 6, 8, it says, He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And in Isaiah 1, 17, learn to do good. Seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. How can we ignore our right to vote in this country? How can we simply relinquish this opportunity to do good? Is it not a sign of our lack of faith? I mean, think about it. Is it not even the slightest sign of, of our ungratefulness to God for this opportunity, this freedom that we have? We, we, we need to exercise this freedom that, that God has given us. Vote for candidates who, who promote justice and mercy and, and policies that support the well-being of all people, especially the vulnerable. And finally, the, the last biblical principle I'll share with you concerning our elections. Be engaged, but don't be divisive. We are Christians. We, we are called to be peacemakers and to avoid engaging in divisive language and actions. While, while your political engagement is important, as Christians, we should maintain a, a Christ-like attitude of grace 
even in our disagreements with one another. Ephesians 4.29 Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Yes, participate in the, in the political process. Prayerfully seek out and, and promote godly candidates. But do so in the right manner without becoming combative or, or disrespectful toward those who, who may hold differing views than, than what you hold. We're Christians. Christ is in our name. Think about that. Christ is in our name, and, and his image should, should be reflected in our words and our actions. Remember, as a Christian, we... We should approach the election of a new president with prayer. That's the first thing, with prayer, with discernment, and a, and a focus on biblical values such as justice and integrity, a respect for life, and a care for the vulnerable. We should evaluate candidates carefully. We should pray for wisdom and, and trust in God's sovereignty over the election process, and the outcome. We should actively engage in voting and all of our civic duties. That freedom comes from God. And as believers, we, we should promote peace and unity and a Christ-like attitude towards those who have views that differ from our own. Let us pray. Dear Father, I, I thank you for your word again today. I just ask that you continue to work in each heart and mind that we, we would hear you today and we would respond. Father, that we would have the heart that we should have, that we would be prayerful, that we would use our, our proper discernment, that we would be grateful for the freedoms we have and, and we would exercise those freedoms. Father, I pray that our, our words and our actions would be those of a peacemaker. Father, I pray, I pray for our country. I pray for our sitting president and all those who are in office now. I pray for your guidance for them. I pray for our election. I pray for those who are running for president and, and all the offices, national, state, and local. I pray for your Holy Spirit's conviction on anyone that, that doesn't know your son. And I pray for those who, who do, that they might be drawn closer to you. I pray that we as your people would respond in a way that pleases you. And we know in, in your sovereign will that all things done and accomplished will be used for your glory. Help us, Lord. Guide us. Let us be, let us be a light and a beacon not only for those seeking, seeking something, seeking your son, 
But Father, that just maybe our our attitudes and our our beliefs towards this election process might might not only be a blessing to you, but would be a, an example, a godly example for those around us. And Father, again, I just, I just lift Susan up to you for your touch, your comfort, your presence. And all these things I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we prepare to sing our hymn of invitation, I encourage you to to come and pray. The altar is open if you would like to pray this morning. If, If you have a burden that you need to pray about, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd love to talk with you and pray with you about that. If you have nothing else to to pray and bring before God this morning. I I encourage you to pray for our nation and our leaders and our election and pray for our people as they go and vote in the next few days. As we stand and sing, Jesus saves, page 418. The altar is open. I know I've got one back there in the corner. <laughs> let's, uh, let's bow for a closing prayer. Dear Father, we just again just thank you for this day, this time together in, in worship of you. Father, we just pray that all things uh, were just pleasing to you as we, as we honor you and praise and, and just lift you up in glory. 
Father, I pray you be with our Sunday school teachers and all those uh, that will be present for that. We just pray your guidance on them. And Father, just be with us this week. Uh, bless us as your people and uh, direct us in your ways. Uh, Father, I just pray that we might go in peace as we, as we serve both you and our fellow man. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.